Um, welcome everybody. We're going to talk about colors and color mixing today. You know, there are so many incredible, beautiful colors available and um, it's, it's enchanting to, to have them on your palette and try them and use them. And some are very hard to mix on your own. But the reality is, is that every color somehow is a combination of yellow, red, or blue. And if you are traditionally trained in uh, painting, you probably started out with a couple of yellows, a couple of reds, and a couple of blues. And um, in addition to that on your palette, you might have a couple of browns, but not needed. Basically, you can mix all your colors with red, blue, and yellow. Um, some yellows that are manufactured are uh, very cool yellows, and some are very warm yellows. So you would, and the same with reds, some are cooler reds and warm reds cooler blues, warm blues. So generally you would have um, a warm and a cool of each of the primary colors, which are red, yellow, and blue. Now when these colors are mixed, when the red and the blue are mixed, um, in fairly equal proportions, we get violet or purple. But when we use a little more red, we get a red violet. and a little more blue, we get a blue violet. When yellow and red are mixed, we get orange. And then we can use a bit more yellow and get a yellow orange, or a bit more red and get a red orange. The same over here. Green is nothing more than a mixture of blue and yellow. So we can, in fairly equal proportions, we can get a bright green. Um, and when we put a little more blue in it, we get a blue-green, or if we put a little more yellow in it, we get a yellow-green. Now what we're going to talk about today is making neutrals. These are muted colors that we can use to do our paintings. We can use them to make shadows. Um, we can mute, use the muted colors to make shadows. For example, say I have um, a big uh, painting with yellow lemons and some green pears and some yellow-green um, mixture in the pears. I mean, I might want to make a shadow color that is a mixture of yellow and violet in order to have a muted shadow tone, but not just use a gray, not just use something very um, um, colorless and just a, a watered down black in a sense. You can also, one of the things I wanted to show you is um, uh, this painting was just recently posted on, um, on my social network with artists, and I was astounded to see how the entire painting is made with neutrals. So these are combinations of opposing colors to get various shades of neutrals, from warm shades to cooler shades, from light shades to dark shades, and the whole painting is done with neutrals, except for a little bit of muted green coming in an angular way. There's a little plant pointing that way, and a path this way, and a path this way of green, all pointing to this little tiny figure with the only primary color in the painting, which is blue. So the figure has value contrast of dark pants and is with two medium value dogs doing movement, the only things that are moving in the painting. But the figure has a few areas of white, 
but what it has is a blue jacket. So it's the only thing in the painting really with color, primary color, which is interesting. So you can do your whole, you can do a whole painting in soft muted tones made by mixing colors to get neutrals. And so this I would consider it a palette made of neutrals. And the way you make neutrals is to take, you can take make neutrals by taking two opposite colors on the color wheel, like yellow and violet. This is these are called complements when they're totally opposite, exactly opposite. So also um, blue and orange are exactly opposite and red and green are exactly opposite. And it's no accident that these colors are chosen for holidays. The yellow and violet is chosen for Easter. Um, you see red and green for, for Christmas. And you see blue and orange for some of the sports teams um, uh, as popular colors because they're very contrasting. But when you mix them together, you get a nice muted color that's not exactly a brown, it's not exactly a gray, but it's a muted neutral kind of color. Good for your shadows and good for complementing the brighter colors in your palette. Aside from doing a straight across what we call complementary colors, you can also use what they call a split complement. So you can mix, for example, a yellow with a red violet or a yellow with a blue violet and get a different type of neutral. You can mix a blue with a red orange or a blue with a yellow orange and this is called a split complement. When it's one, one shade one mixture of color apart from the primary. Say, for example, I took a red and mix it with a blue-green. That's a split complement. But when I mix it with the green, I'm mixing complementary color. When I mix it with the yellow-green, I'm getting a split complement mixture. So you can use those complementary mixtures and split complementary mixtures to make interesting neutral tones of muted color. And what I'm going to show you in this video is a combination of some very vivid colors how and, and show you how when they're mixed together they become very muted and can be used in different ways in your paintings. So um, that's what the video is about and I hope you enjoy it. So I, I mentioned to you that um, the direct opposite of yellow is violet. There are quite a range of yellows. Um, I'm choosing a cadmium yellow and I'm choosing an imperial purple as the most traditional kind of um, yellow and purple for this first demonstration. So there you can see the color. <clears throat> it's a cadmium yellow. And, and cadmium yellow comes in three levels. There's cadmium yellow light and cadmium yellow deep. And this is just normal, medium cadmium yellow. Um, sometimes nowadays they, because cadmium was ma is made from the real cadmium, heavy metal, which is a toxic heavy metal. Um, nowadays they will use something else to make the cadmium yellow and they might call it cadmium yellow hue. Um, or else they will use something more transparent than cadmium yellow, which is a bit oh, semi-opaque. And the closest color to that is 
Hansa yellow. And like the cadmiums, they make a Hansa <coughs> yellow deep and a Hansa yellow light. And so many people now are using Hansa yellow instead of cadmium yellow. But these two are directly opposite each other on the color chart. So these are called complements. So this yellow is directly opposite the purple or the violet. <clears throat> the complement. So the mixture is a complementary mixture. So if I start, I can take some of that mixture, beginning with the yellow, and then add some purple, more or less, in pretty equal tones. And look how muted and neutral that color becomes, you see? So that's, that's the basic um, color that you get when you mix those two. And then I can make some of that a little more yellow. And I can make some of that mixture a little more purple. And so I have, out of these two colors, made now already five colors, and there can be more variations. So I'm going to just put this on my chart here because I want to. I'm making some charts to remind myself of what I get when I mix these colors. So I'm showing the, the more yellow part of the mixture, and I'm showing the more purple part of the mixture, and then the basic mixture in the center. And I want to do an exercise to remind myself about these colors and how they might fit together. So I've made a little, um, it's just a little mini, little mini um, <coughs> square of a landscape, a possible landscape with some mountains and sky and water. And on each one of these sheets that I'm going to do for this video, I'm just going to demonstrate First of all, putting in some of the the darker color of the two <clears throat> of the two, which in this case is the purple in the sky, and then some plain water. And we're going to drop in the the yellow, and uh, they'll they'll do a little bit of mixing. As I move the, I can move the board a little bit and let them diffuse together a little bit. And I don't mind to leave some of the sky a bit colorless. Okay. And then I want to show how I can use this yellow also to have a highlighted some water there. A highlighted side of the mountain on one case. And this is very roughly drawn just as an exercise. And then take the, the mixture color and do another hill next to it just to as part of this exercise. And then take the more purpley darker, more purpley mixture and make a little more another little hillside. So what I'm trying to do is just create a piece of paper that reminds me of how these colors play together if I want to do a painting 
that is, is just a mixture of these two colors and the various shades of neutrals. Let me take a little bit of the purple out of there, diffused into the yellow. Okay, let me repair that central one a little bit. And then I'll just show a little bit of dirty water and let some of the color uh, from the hillsides diffuse down into that. So that just reminds me of how these colors interact together. And I'll put these, um, I'm create, what I'm doing is trying to create a little bit of hand to eye memory. Because if you just read about how the colors combine, and you look at them in a book, and even if you just make the mixture of them, it's not the same as doing a little bit of painting with them. And that little bit of painting with them is something that your mind will not forget, and you will have what's called hand-to-eye memory. It's the kind of memory that pianists and typists have. And they 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 don't have to look at their cans, their fingers remember what to do, and they have a sense of how it will come out. And the whole thing fits together holistically. Um, once you bring your hands and your eyes together with um, what your mind is trying to do, so. This is um, an exercise that I would suggest doing. I'm going to do this exercise with a wide range of complementary colors and a wide range of split complementary colors. So as I said, this is the um, this is an example of the complementary colors of violet and yellow. But if I want to take the red-violet with a yellow, I get a skip split complement that is very different, as you can see. And that's done with a quinacridone um, violet and aurelian yellow. This one's cadmium yellow. And then I decided I would do the same thing again with an Indian yellow which is a little more on the orangey side, another split uh, complement, and a Mars violet, again, which is a reddish violet, and a totally different set of neutral outputs in that case. So I find this um, a very good exercise to do because your paints are your instruments and um, you have to know how to make your instrument work for you. And so by doing this kind of an exercise, you can see what your palette is able, the, what the colors on your palette are able to produce. And also, the nice thing about it is if you decide you want to do a painting, that is, like I can make this a little darker, this little mountainside can make this a little darker by just putting a little more purple in it directly pure pigment so sometimes it can be a little lighter it can be a little darker you can have different but what you can do is look at it and say you know, I could make some kind of a scene with that in the same way that painting that I showed you with all the neutrals was done with a wide variety of neutrals in one painting. And only that one tiny figure, the blouse on that figure, is done with a primary color. Okay, we're going to, we're going to continue this exercise. I'm going to show you a bunch of different ones on this video, and I hope you enjoy yourself. In, when we make brown 
Brown is uh, a mixture of um, reds and yellows, and it falls within this framework as a version of that. Um, it might have some other, a small amount of other color in it, but it's a mixture largely of red and yellow. So whenever we take something in this range that's the brownish tone, and we mix it with one of the blues, we get a very nice neutral. And it's the most popular of all the neutrals that we see in landscapes. So I just want to show you on my, <coughs> on my mixing tray here, if I take, and in landscape, the most common color that they'll use to mix the neutral is ultramarine blue. And that's because in landscape it is so popular to have the granulation in landscape. So if I mix in, so the, the most popular mixture is this one. Burnt Sienna and ultramarine blue in different combinations of blue and burnt sienna. But you can do a wide range of neutrals <coughs> using those two colors. Very, very popular. And if you and because the, the ultramarine can be very dark, you can really take that mixture to a dark level and get an almost black, but one that is rich and interesting. So you will see this range of colors used often in landscape, especially with trees and stones and all kinds of things. Now, if you want to change it a little bit and use one of the other browns, you can do that, you can do that with um, burnt umber, which is this color here, and you get a very different, you see, you get a very different, cooler, uh, since the burnt center is a very warm brown, very reddish brown, very warm brown, but if you do it with the burnt umber, you see you get a very intermediate, cool brown. And then you can make it very dark in some places. So that's with the burnt umber. Now if I take that color away and I show you um, again the same. You can use it with um, walnut brown or sepia brown. There are so many different browns available. Um, but you can take that burnt sienna, I mean that ultramarine blue, and use it with the Van Dyke brown, which is the darkest brown. And it gives you almost a black. Very, very dark, but a warmer black than a plain black. And you can make it a little more blue, or you can make it a little more dark. But the Van Dyke brown is very dark. Whereas the walnut brown is almost a little bit lavender, uh, slightly. So each one of the, each brown with a blue will give you a different look. Now, if you couple those three browns or those all your browns with cobalt blue, again, you'd have a different look. Um, but with the ultramarine blue, you get granulation. So with this particular neutral, I, I would like to do <clears throat> when I put it on the paper you can see better how much of a gray that intermediate mixture is. It's really a very nice gray and when it has a little more of the brown in it 
you can see it changes a bit. It's a little warmer when it has more of the brown in it. And it, when it has more of the blue in it, it's cooler and it's more of a steely blue-gray. So that's the mixture for this particular painting. I'm just going to take my I'm going to take my water and do the same thing that we just were doing and just put a little bit of blue in here. Let that mix. And I think I'll take the the lightest, the warmest of the neutrals in here. I'll just put a little bit of that in here. It gives you a very different kind of sky, doesn't it? I don't want to use the brown directly, although I could take a little bit of the brown directly and put that in. This is the brown. And let them mix. <clears throat> Diffuse a little bit in here with the water and leave some white. It gives you, it can give you an interesting sky. If you want to create a nice stormy sky um, or an evening sky, you can mix those two together. Okay. And then I'm going to use the warmest um, brown directly, the Van Dyke brown directly in the first landscape as we had done before. And then go down to the middle level mixture and do that there. This is just to give you some idea of how we can play with that. And then go down to the most blue of the mixture. This, this group of hills or landscape that's furthest away from the light. And then I can take the, um, go back and take the little darkest one for this more remote hillside here that is mostly it's um, a little it's it's mostly the brown with the blue but it's um, less got less water in that mixture so I'm just doing that like that I don't want the colors to mix so I'm keeping them separate and then I'll just put a little bit of dirty, a little bit of the water, and let some little tiny bit of that color go down into the water for that particular one. Blend that a little better there. But with two colors and the possibility to create a painting again with two colors and you automatically have color harmony when you do that and um, you can decide where you want to have your neutrals and where you want to have your two colors alone okay so browns and blues <clears throat> give you a wide range of lovely uh, any brown with any blue will give you very nice neutral shadow colors and probably the most the most common mixture you will see of making neutrals <clears throat> but we're going to expand our horizons and go with a variety of uh, <laughs> neutrals that push the envelope of the range beyond blues and green blues and browns.
Okay, that's enough for right now. This is a um, another blue and brown mixture. Cerulean blue is a very warm blue. Um, a very slightly greenish, but a very warm blue. And um, manganese blue is even more intense and granulating um, in, in a blue, but they're similar. Uh, manganese is more intense. Cerulean blue is often used for skies by many artists. Now, coupling it with the burnt umber, um, another one of those browns we just discussed, look at these wonderful neutrals that we have when we have a little more blue in it or when we have a little more brown in it and in the middle this warm gray. Um, these colors together could be very useful to make a whole series of stone walls um, with the three colors together just made with these two by mixing these two. And so um, I've done the same exercise here on the bottom. This is when it's mostly brown and a little less water and darker. And then um, the two colors together when it's um, very softly the blue added, a lot of water. Then in the middle tone here, a um, little less water, and then the more bluish one here with um, a reasonable amount of water, and then with less water. And then just some dirty water from the mixture added to it. Um, so the whole painting here created with just these two colors mixed together, a blue and a brown. As we move through the browns, uh, sometimes uh, this transparent red oxide is used as a replacement for burnt sienna. It's more red and it's more transparent. I'll put some burnt sienna next to it so you can see. They are different, but um, <clears throat> some people prefer to use the transparent red oxide. But since we're talking about browns and blues. I thought it would be nice to share with you uh, this wonderful cobalt teal, just one of my favorite colors. And let's see how they mix together to make a neutral. Look at how the two of them <clears throat> make that, that warm brown neutral. Okay, quite lovely, isn't it? So we can put some of that on our palette. <coughs> on our on our paper rather. And if I want to just show how it would look when it's lighter, I'll just put a little water below and let some of it diffuse into the water. <coughs> and then let's make the mixture a little more red on one side, a little less. Let's see if we can make it a little more red. So you can see how it behaves. Oh, it needs a little more in there. So we can get more of a reddish hue reddish um, tone or whatever kind of color. So let's put a little water on the edge of that and see how it looks when it's diluted. Okay, and then we'll do the same thing in terms of making it a little more blue as a mixture. And then it becomes more of a, a grayish kind of neutral. So let's show that here. Really a bunch of beautiful colors. 
And what is so very nice about both of these colors is that they granulate. They're both granulating colors and um, see how it loots so nicely. But and you can see granulation more when you move your paint back and forth and let some of the granulation settle in the crevices. But you can see the granulation in this color here. I'll hold it up to the uh, camera a little better. I think you can see some of the some of the granulation when you get close up. <clears throat> so this is one with uh, a, 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 t a type of blue and a type of brown. Um, you can see the strong granulation in the sky here where it's more concentrated. And um, look how rich that color can be when it's on its own. It's one of my favorite colors when I do my abstracts. I love to have the this color in there. So um, anyway, here's here's some of that with a, a light version of the teal and um, a light version of the middle neutral, and then um, a little more darker here and let me just put a little more of this more blue darker teal over here so you can see it a little better the one that's more bluish so this is it becomes a very nice reference for what these two colors can do and in the mixture here I don't know how well you can see it, but close up, um, you can see how it separates and granulates in this area here with reds and blues separating side by side. And you can see the granulation in the sky there. Wonderful colors and um, for creating neutrals, uh, they could really be put to a lot of good use. Okay, so that's one. Um, we uh, talked about the um, blues and browns, and I wanted to show you one more blue and brown. Um, the browns are in the family of oranges, as I mentioned to you before. So they're in this range here with blue and orange mixed together and then some additional color to switch it to brown. So, but when we mix the browns, this one is cobalt blue and burnt sienna. You can see the very soft burnt sienna when it's got a lot of water in it. And the cobalt blue, which is not a granulating color, it's a fairly transparent color and non-granulating and so you see how they mix together a little bit here this is the cobalt blue just with water and then here's <coughs> the warm mixture with the burnt sienna and cobalt this is the more medium mixture of more equal burnt sienna and cobalt and then when there's more blue in the mix and there's less water, this is the darker color that you can get. <clears throat> now, I want to move on to um, a set of colors that are strictly orange and blue and not mixtures of the orange turning brown. So, to see what we get. So, if we take the orange and blue, um, as, which are strictly complements, one blue that is popular is cerulean blue. It's a nice, bright, vivid blue, good sky color. And a, a very, what's called transparent orange. And so I've put um, the two colors separate in the sky with different levels of water 
and put the orange here with very with a lot of water and then made a mixture on the warm side with more orange than cerulean blue put that here and on this side more blue than orange and put that here and then the more combined equal mixture with less water and put that here so that's one example of doing the complement of blue and orange. <clears throat> if we take a much too, too much more vivid blues and orange, um, if you take phthalo blue, which is very bright, and pyro orange, again very bright, um, and do exactly the same exercise, you do get brighter different colors. So Here's the, the blue alone, the orange alone, different amounts of water, the orange alone. But then when there's more orange than blue, the mixture is warm like this. When there's more blue and it's more equal, it's in the center like this. And when you make it a bit darker with more blue, it's like this or like this, you know, depending on how much blue you have in there. So with those two very vivid colors, you get a different effect. I don't often use the pyro blue and the phthalo blue and the phthalo green because they are staining colors. And once you put them on the paper, you really can't uh, lift them. <clears throat> now I'd like to go to a completely different family, which is to take the complements the complement of red and green and mix them and see what kind of neutral we get from that. Oops, sorry. And um, here we have alizarin crimson, which is very intense. And, and deep, and phthalo green, which again is very bright color. Here you see the green alone, and here the alizarin crimson alone, different levels of water, the alizarin crimson with a lot of water, and then the mixture of the two um, with more alizarin crimson with a fair amount of water, and then the mixture with less, less water. And the mixture over here, and this is more in, in the equal mixture here. And then over here, more green than red. You see it here, it's very intense. And less water. So you can get quite a range depending on the ratio of your mixtures and the amount of water you put into those mixtures. I've put a little water on the sides of each of these mixtures so that the color would diffuse out and show you the lighter versions of those. <clears throat> Another green, uh, um, if we go to a green and a violet, <clears throat> a green <clears throat> and a violet, when there, when there are certain mixtures, if you could take a yellow green, and a red violet, again, that is a complement because it's a straight line through the center. It's not going to the side. If I used a pure violet with that yellow green and took it over here, it would be, because here's the center of the triangle, it would be a split complement. But this is a straight complement, and this is what happens when we mix the sap green with the perylene violet, which is a very deep and sort of a little bit on the brownish side, reddish side, violet, very intense. And um, when you mix them together, you get this um, fairly neutral color that's shown here when they're more equal in levels. When you have more of the violet and less of the green, you get more the color more like this 
like this. And when you just have a little bit with the sap green and more sap green, you get a mixture that's a little more like that. Here it is with more water. So this is the color, the perylene violet, when it has a fair amount of water in it. This is the sap green when it has a lot of water in it. And here it is when it has a lot of water in it. But then the rest of the mixtures have much less water. You can see them. Now, um, I'd like to show you a, <clears throat> a split complement, complementary pairing. Because if you go to a red, red violet toward a bluish green, it's, it's a split. Okay? It's a split. So when we take magenta, quinacridone magenta with cobalt turquoise, which is in the, it's in the blue family. This is in the violet family, but they're off to the side as secondary colors. And look at the kinds of ranges of neutrals you get with those, which are interesting too to play with. Um, this color can be very intense and beautiful. This is cobalt turquoise. And then when it's watered down, the quinacridone magenta is a very soft, light color. But then when they're mixed together, and I'll show you how they, they look when we mix them together. <clears throat> I'm going to take some of that magenta and put that on my mixing dish. This is a color I use a lot. I really love it. One of my favorite colors. And I'll take some of the uh, cobalt turquoise. Again, another very favorite color. It's, um, the cobalt turquoise is a little more green than the cobalt teal. The cobalt teal is a little more blue and the turquoise a little more green tone. So if I take those two colors and mix them together, you can see the kind of violet that I get from them. Okay. And then if I use more of the blue on one side, oops, I need a little more of that turquoise in there. So if I have a little more turquoise in there, I get more of a, almost a gray. And when I take the magenta and mix more of that in there, I get more of a reddish violet. Okay, so that's another. So we can just take some plain water and see how they spread out. And we add some water next to the colors. Let them the color diffuse a bit. And it gives us some idea of how light it will go. So this um, make this a little darker. You can see when you put more color in it, they automatically get a little darker. Just more color, less water, and it gets darker. So that's the shade, and then this is the shade, and then this one is a little more like that. So that's again going in a, the family of violet. Uh, that one is a, a red violet, more toward a blue-green 
So it's a split complement, not going through the center, not like the last, not like the one that was alizarin crimthum and a uh, viridian or the sap green and perylene green was a complement. The alizarin crimson with the viridian was a complement, whereas this one is a split complement. Okay, I think that's uh, probably it for now, and um, I hope you felt that you enjoyed these, these ideas of how to mix these colors. Now, whenever we mix colors, one final thing we might want to pay attention to is that if we add um, the color is the color itself that we mix is called a hue, whatever the color is. So if this is a, a pure color of opera pink, this is a hue. When we add white to any color, it's called a tint of that color. And if we add gray to that color, um, it's called a tone, that should say tone of that color. And if we add some black to that color, it's called a shade of that color. And depending on how much water we put into any of these colors, that affects the value, which is basically the intensity of the color. Okay. So that's, that's it for our color mixing today, learning about complements and split complements and how to make neutrals. I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you for coming to visit me in my studio.